Hello everyone. So I'm going to be talking um, about some case studies. Um, apologies to anyone who has heard slightly similar versions of this talk before. It's quite different, it's like the same. Um, so I've been focusing recently on really in-depth studies of what conscious objectors in the First World War say about their consciences and how their decision making works. So what I'm going to focus on here is men who were six men, hopefully we have time, maybe less, um, who were within the system. Okay, so they were negotiating the system and, and working with it but also against it at the same time. Um, what I'm trying to reflect is their individual stories but also a sense of connection between them and with others at science, so the idea of support and the lack of isolation, but also there's a degree of isolation here as well. Um, but also the very different motivations and strategies, tactics and thinking that's going on and emotions that are going on here. So I'm going to go straight in, otherwise I'm not going to get to cover many of the men. So my first is um, George um, Baker. Um, so um, apologies, I like black slides. It's not great on this kind of stuff, but this one at least works. So George Baker. Um, wrote um, Soul of the Skunk in 1930. It was written, as you can see, for his son um, Paul. And we might reflect on that. Obviously, the different accounts I'm drawing on for each of these men was written at a different time and for a different purpose. Some are more contemporary. Some are reflections back. Some are for particular audiences. So, for example, um, the accounts written for a tribunal that's judging a man might be very different to ones that are written to family and letters for example, a different perspective, motivations, and of course we reflect differently on what we do at different times in our lives. It doesn't make any account less genuine, just we have to I think, be aware of the context. So um, Baker um, was called up in 1916, he was in his early 20s. Um, he uh, described himself as a freelance pacifist, he um, was a socialist, an internationalist, believed in civilization rather than what he saw was the imperialist chaos of war and um, nations squabbling, or the ruling classes squabbling over property on different levels of scale. Um, he describes himself also as being agnostic. He's certainly very scathing about the Humpty Dumpty thinking he saw around him amongst other objectors who had Christian motivations and he uses that phrase. Um, so when he's called up, he applies to a tribunal for exemption, um, but for complete absolute exemption. He, he does, however, admit that he doesn't fit the conscious objector model in the classic sense, or the legislative sense, because he didn't define object fighting in all wars. So if he was fighting the ruling classes for revolution, that might be an entirely different matter. So this particular war he objected to in fighting his fellow workers. So applies to a tribunal, doesn't get absolute exemption, gets partial exemption, so within the military but within the non-competent corps, and adopts a quite unsuccessful suicide strategy. He, he goes on the run very temporarily, um, hides under a hedge, hopes he'll starve, he, he subsequent, as he subsequently describes it. He's worried about the shame caused to his family, potentially, how they will see him, how they will be treated by his conscientious stance. Um, he's found by his father, though, quite soon after, um, and is persuaded to hand himself over to the military. Serves a year in the non-combatant corps, so taking a, um, a, a role in, behind the scenes, if you like, but within the military wearing a uniform, finds that time increasingly difficult. Describes himself, seeing himself as a, being a Judas unto himself, um, a traitor to himself, to his conscience, um, and struggles a lot with it across that year and eventually is looking for, describes himself as looking for the opportunity to refuse an order, but waiting for the right order. He's particularly concerned he might be treated as a, a normal soldier disobeying and be sent to military ballots rather than be treated as a conscientious objector and sent to civilian um, jail post um, court martial. So he's looking for a significant refusal. He's hoping there'll be loading munitions or something to be able to say, well, you know, 
I'm a non-combatant, I'm a conscious objector, that's recognised, so court martial me, but don't send me into military barrack detention, which it can be even more brutal than the um, civil prison regime. <coughs> In the end, that doesn't happen. He keeps on having some false starts when he thinks he's able to object, but he's loading not munitions, but alcohol at various phases. Um, so he ends up just refusing to pick up a bit of waste paper and just throw it onto the ground. And actually does get treated as an objector, goes to prison, finds that really liberating. So he talks about the fact that um, he would have betrayed the light that was in him had he not made that final decision. It was a relief to make that decision. Having said that, he struggled um, as the prison experience continued, particularly with silence and isolation that that could sometimes produce, unsurprisingly. So that's the first story. Second story is a, a very well-known objector in Quaker circles. So, Paul Catchpole was 29 when the war broke out in 14. He immediately and Quaker, and he immediately joined the Friends Ambulance Unit as being set up in November 1914. And he, he went out. He served on the Western Front and actually was awarded the Mon Star for service at the front. Um, his motivation was clearly Christian um, and he talks about the idea of seeing what he was doing and how he was being led as being a command directly from God. Um, he also talks subsequently given his, his decision in 1916 when conscription came, also bearing witness which is a common thing um, also amongst objectors. So in 16 um, conscription is introduced and he's reflecting on how, how the, the war is going at the front and how the FAU is working. Okay, he's increasingly seeing it as part of the military machine, as partly taking a, being part of the command, being, and he's also um, no longer so hands are in terms of help, he's administrative, he's working alongside the military, maybe taking some of the work away from the medical corps. So he feels that he's now cooperating and with the coming of conscription feels he has to stand and bear witness so he goes, comes back here and um, appears having been called up before a tribunal, is again awarded non-combatant service, uh, that's not what he wants, he wants total exemption and becomes an absolutist in prison. So we see a change of course um, during the war but a consistency in conscience having maybe to adapt given changing circumstances. Okay, um, third man is Robert W. Forrester. Um, he was in his early 20s, trained to be a teacher when war broke out. Um, he was a Quaker meeting attender. And he um, Again, appeared before a tribunal, again, uh, was awarded non-combatant service as his level of exemption was unsatisfactory to him. He also wanted absolute exemption. So, um, he ended up, first of all, in um, Wandsworth military detention barracks where he was severely beaten up and I'd, I'd say tortured. He was one of the men who suffered um, quite clearly at the hands of the military, a very graphic account of um, that provided in what is described as a diary was probably written up after the time because of the lack of access to pen and pencil or pen and paper um, but a very brutal account of um, a military coming in and, and, and trying to force him to obey orders so it suffered quite considerably in the, the military regime when he was in military barracks in, in prison slightly different story he found it hard but different than hard uh, not that level of brutality, a different kind of brutality, if you like, in terms of the regime um, that's going on there. So his motivation is Christian, as a Quaker attender. He talks about obeying the command of God. There's a lot of discussion, actually more so than in the Christian accounts that I've been through, that you might... You might expect prayer to, to figure very largely in those accounts, and actually it doesn't so much as it does in, in Forrester's um, story. He also talks about, I guess you could say, negotiating conscience, or conscience as a process. Conscience is something about community, it's about looking at others for him, and working out what the best strategy is 
what's best for others as well. So let me just explain that. So the first statement, I'm not sure how easy this is to read, even it's kind of focused for me from here at least. Um, so the first statement, I hereby reaffirm my determination not to undertake any form of military service. Um, whatever, I keep the cost of my refusal to do so. That's part of his statement to the tribunal. It's a very definite, it's very clear. Of course it has to be. It has to be an all or nothing. He's asking for absolute exemption. It has to be a firm stance. The second statement comes from um, paragraph 52 of his diary, typed up by his daughter, the paragraphs are numbered at that stage. So to refuse absolutely and entirely to engage in military service seems a very plain and straightforward course before one enters on it. But I think most CEOs will agree that in practice, the most wearing times in their experience have been when they've been called upon to decide in this difficult set of circumstances or that, which is the really conscientious course to pursue compared with this physical discomfort uh, are as nothing. So let me explain what he's talking about there or how that plays out. So um, he describes a number of situations where COs jointly are talking about what they should do. Not only is he individually praying or praying in groups of CEOs when they're able to communicate, so particularly pre corps martial being held by the military, um, but also sometimes negotiating with those who are guarding them okay, and trying to work out what best to do. So he describes his first court martial experience. Um, the group of CEOs he's with are forcibly dressed in military uniform and um, they are taken to the hearing, they're waiting, there's a lunch recession they haven't been dealt with. And so the demands come to them and say, look, we, we really want to take off your handcuffs that you've been in all morning, but we know what will happen when we take off the handcuffs. You'll take off the uniforms. Then we'll have to forcibly dress you all before the court martial hearing in the afternoon. Otherwise, we'll get in trouble. Um, we'd rather not do that. We would like to take off your handcuffs so you can eat and you can relax a bit and then go back in and we'll all be happier. Okay, so um, there's a negotiation, there's a discussion between the men and some are deeply unhappy about this idea of remaining in uniform for any period of time where it's not forced, but they come to the conclusion that they will do that because some want to compromise and there are regards to think of as well. Okay, so they wear the uniform and there are a few instances where that negotiation happens and he, he talks about feelings of guilt sometimes because some of the men have a real problem with this, understandably, being in military uniform voluntarily as it would appear, looking as soldiers. Um, he also talks about the kind of, he, he, when he was held in military barracks and tortured, he, he um, refused to compromise at any level. Okay, absolutely refused to compromise at all. When he was transferred to the civilian prison system, he had to reflect on whether he'd um, do the work, classic sewing mail bags, whether he'd, he'd obey the system, if you like, he'd conform with the system. He describes thinking about how much his health had been ruined mentally and psychologically, physically as well, by the, the brutality in the military, looking forward what that might mean upon release, you know, and what kind of level of compromise he should come up with. So he, he did, he, he adhered to, to some extent, um, the civilian prison regime. So conscience, if you like, as, as communal, as negotiated, as, as maybe not as clear as he at first suggests to the tribunal, and not surprisingly. Okay, next we have Frank Merrick. Um, so Frank Merrick has a Bristol connection. He's part of the exhibition, which you should go and see. Not very far from here. Um, he um, was 31 when he was called up in, in 1916. He um, was a pianist of some note, professor then at uh, Manchester, um, a composer, and a concert pianist. Already making quite a name for himself at this stage, he was to go on to, to make more of a name for himself after the First World War. Um, he had also been, prior to the war, a vegetarian, very committed vegetarian, a campaigner for the vote for women, so very much politically engaged. And he speaks um, in his Imperial War Museum recordings about um, how traumatised he was by the outbreak of war, 
by the declaration of war, and, and by some people's reactions to it, he had been allied with. So Christabel Pankhurst, particularly recruiting, he found very difficult to deal with. He felt he could not kill any life form, hence the vegetarianism, so how could he possibly go to war? So he would not kill. Um, so it's a moral objection in his case, with a political link in, absolutely. So he um, goes to prison as an absolutist, is involved in a number of protests at Wormwood Scrubs and at Wandsworth. Um, prison um, in his single sentence, I think he said. Yeah. Um, and actually, his protest is quite interesting. So, his first was his wedding ring was removed and he didn't like that, so he refused to cooperate in any way with the prison authorities, civilian prison authorities, and therefore was not allowed to communicate with the outside world for a good period, longer than he would otherwise have been restricted. Um, he also um, did what many CEOs did and communicated by tapping pipes between cells to break the silence rule. One of the little, very important ways of undermining prison discipline. And he also resisted early release. Um, the Royal College of Music were very keen to have him back. And they kept, wanted to campaign for him to come out early. And he said he was prepared to resign his job <coughs> in doing that. He didn't want to be a special case, he wanted to remain until um, he did, until the um, spring of um, 19. So vegetarian, suffragist, refusing to kill. Two more to go, I'll be very quick. Okay, just about. It starts a bit late, yeah? Yeah, Okay, er Evan Meredith, I'm not going to even attempt the Welsh pronunciation of that because I can't do it. Um, okay, so Evan Meyer and Abertilly, um, He's not called up into the beginning of 1918 when there's a combing out of miners who of course are needed for the war effort but um, that begins to change as the war progresses and the perception is that more men are needed. So Evan is, describes himself as um, being bordering on an atheist though he's had a Christian upbringing in the valleys. Um, he's very much a political objector, I think, in terms of his motivations, if you read some things he's saying here. Um, but actually he describes himself as being a moral objector, he will not kill. Okay, and he ends up... Um, <laughs> so you can see here that um, he says that he thinks the training he received in political and industrial affairs, he was attending talks, he was a trade unionist, he was involved in protests, he talks about attending a whole range of different speakers about the Russian Revolution, and uh, workers' rights, trade union law as well. Um, so consciously was satisfied that his resistance was consistent with the upheavals with, upheavals with miners and other workers had fought against low wages, bad conditions, extreme poverty, living side by side with extreme wealth. And he talks very much about seeing the soldiers being sent away to slaughter as being very much the miners, being sent, like the miners being sent down the mines. We replaced by young boys just being cyclical, so that kind of class oppression has been very similar. So he's arrested and taken to Brecon Barracks, court martialed, refusing to wear a uniform. He serves a six month sentence in um, Wormwood Scrubs and then is, is released immediately, taken into military hands, court martialed again, and so, serves his next sentence, or not quite all of it, um, 12 months in Carmarthen um, prison. Um, so here we have very much a political objector, and that politics shows when he is at Carmarthen, um, we've had the armistice, and a lot of objectors were hunger striking, they've been hunger striking previously for various reasons, at this stage it was about release rather than conditions. So he leads a hunger strike at Carmarthen and gets released with the other 20 or so objectors who are there, um, temporarily apparently under the cat and mouse act, the provision for temporary release made for um, suffragettes previously, and actually we don't think he went back again. He was released and um, eventually that was, that was it for him, that was the end of his <coughs> war story. So, last slide. Okay, so this is Max Plowman, barely legible. Um, he was the oldest of the objectors I'm talking about today. So he was um, in his early 30s, like Merrick. Um, and 
very different story, we're going in reverse. He joined up in 1914 on the 24th of December. He had moral objections to the war, but he felt it was something he needed to do, and he joined up as an officer. Um, by 1916, he had a very different view, and on leave, um, he asked for uh, release from his commission and achieved that on conscience grounds significantly, so going in the reverse direction if you like, came back to, a, well he was, on, he was, I think he was recovering from injury actually at the time, so he was in this country, then he got called up. So he appeared before tribunal repeatedly with that tribunal trying to work out what to do with him, because the system obviously wanted to draw him back into the military, but military not that keen necessarily to have him back probably at this point and he seems to have been to let slip through so the war ends and he's not drawn back into that military system but it's a continual kind of deferral decision making there so part of his objection is is it's there before the war but it's increased by his experiences um, and I've got to end on that reverse note and that idea of heroism and cowardice from someone who was very much at the front Okay, so that's my six stories. There Thanks, Lois. That's great. We're going to ask Lois after uh, uh, Cyril has uh, spoken. Our next speaker is Cyril Pierce, um, who people may know uh, compiled the national data to the database of COs. We've extracted all the names which are in the exhibition of the cathedral over the road. Uh, he's written a book. Can we do the thing with the thing? Can we swap over the um, memory stick? Was it a memory stick in there or did we... Should be. Can you get me those? His hero has written a book about his home, hometown of Huddersfield called the, the Comrades in Conscience, which I'm pretty certain on his, his half or so up there. He's, he, 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 he's uh, writing a new Look about war resistance, resistance, and I'm sure that part of what he says this morning will feature what is in his book. Is that right, Cyril? Well, I'll hand you over, Cyril. He's going to speak for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Jeremy, and thanks, uh, thanks to Lois for setting things up, as it were. I've got a problem <coughs> with the existing history of the anti-war movement in Britain in 1914-18. Uh, I've got a problem in particular with the way in which conscientious objectors are characterised, not so much by the opposition, but by the movement itself. And it seems to me that there are certain cliched images of the nature of that opposition, which we need to look a bit behind. Some of them, obviously, like all cliches, are true. Others of them, misleading. For example, if we look at the maybe 20,000 or so conscientious objectors, men who declared themselves to be conscientious objectors to fighting, or were in some indirect way declared conscientious objectors, you will find that unlike the stories that Lois introduced this afternoon, uh, about 60% of them made some accommodation with the war effort, whether it's serving in the Friends Ambulance Unit, serving as non-combatants in the Royal Army Medical Corps, or more particularly, engaging in work of national importance on the land, in some cases in industry that's not war directly related and so on. So 60% and in some cases, I've just finished a study of, would you believe, a CEO hotspot in South London called Croydon. I don't think of Croydon as being a hot bed of anything much, or at least certainly in the time of the First World War, but 70% of the CEOs identified as such in Croydon took some kind of war service that satisfied their own conscience objection to fighting and killing, but in some way rendered service to the war effort. We don't hear much about those. We're not going to hear much about those this afternoon. I put that down as a marker to say this is one of the major distortions, if you like, of the story. But for the rest, the other third, 25% of third or thereabouts, there's also something of a distortion in the story. And these are the martyrs as part of that story here, looking ever so much like a martyr. He doesn't look at all well at all, does he? Clifford Allen, he's been in prison, he's 
had a very difficult time. He's at death's door, effectively, when he's finally released from prison as a conscience objector, and he becomes, largely due to the work of one of his close colleagues, Catherine Marshall, and the writers in the Tribunal, which is the No Conscription Fellowship newspaper, something of the martyr hero <coughs> of the anti-war movement. And we have other almost martyr heroes. Bert Brocklesby, school teacher and Methodist lay preacher from South Yorkshire, from Conisborough, just outside Mexborough, not too far away from, from Doncaster. Again, the sort of archetypal Christian, maybe socialist, but certainly Christian conscience objector who served time in prison and is much written about in all the standard texts on the anti-war movement. Similarly, as Lois has just said, another of the classic, <coughs> stereotypical, and I even, I would argue, cliché war resistor images in that of people like Corder, Catchpole. What we don't see quite as much of in the account, and this is partly due to the fact that the anti-war movement itself was nervous about it, partly also due to the fact that Many aspects of what I want to talk about in a moment or two are effectively secret, they're illegal, they don't get recorded at the time for the very obvious reason that if they were to be recorded, people would end up in prison, not to serve a conscience objection for doing things that were not welcome under the Defence of the Realm Act and the like. But here's one of the characters, I use him simply as a, what shall we say, a starting point. Guy Aldred. Guy Aldred well known, if you like, in libertarian left-wing circles before the war, author, newspaper editor of his own, very, very prominent in what you might call the awkward squad, conscience objector, in the summer of 1918. He was at the centre of a great deal of disturbance within Wormwood Scrubs, so much so that he was regarded as a ringleader and was shipped out of Wormwood Scrubs for encouraging men to disobey prison regulations, shipped out to Brixton, I don't know what he did in Brixton, apparently it was a bit quieter out there, but eventually when he'd uh, reformed, it suggested, he comes back to Wandsworth in the autumn of 1918 and he and even Frank Merrick alongside him, we'll come to him in, him in a minute, are at the centre of a major outbreak of disobedience among conscience objectors in Wandsworth Prison, which runs right the way through to the spring of 1919, and from time to time actually engages with and involves, as I'm sure Julian's going to mention in his paper this afternoon, uh, involves soldiers who are held in prison who are not necessarily conscience objectors. So he's a real stir at his old but if you look at the tribunal, no conscription fellowship newspaper and look at other accounts of the anti-war movement. Aldred is dismissed as well. It's, it's Guy Aldred, isn't it? He would do that, wouldn't he? Or he would say that, wouldn't he? He's parked to one side and perhaps it's something to do with post-war reputation. In the 1920s and 30s, Aldred has moved to Glasgow, although he's a Londoner by origin, and he becomes very actively involved in left-wing causes in Glasgow. Here he is with a group of anarchists from Spain during the Spanish uh, Civil War of the 1930s. And he becomes, if you like, a stormy petrol of the extreme left in British politics. And Frank Merrick was with him in Wandsworth during those disturbances. What's interesting and what is often overlooked, as I suggested a moment or two ago, is the extent to which within the anti-war movement, within that if you like, minority who took a strong line. There were those who prepared to engage in what was, to all intents and purposes, illegal activity. The kind of illegal activity that uh, would have caused problems for the movement more generally at the time, and certainly was not dealt with adequately in some of the historical accounts in the 1920s and 30s. On the anti-war movement written in 1922 was at great pains to suggest that the anti-war movement was to all intents and purposes law-abiding and paid very little attention to the work of people like this. Here are two of my Huddersfield men, you can see them, Arthur Gardner, Percy Ellis, both of them <coughs> men of the left members of the British Socialist Party, Marxists, took the view that the war was a war for 
markets, it was a war about empire, nothing to do with working people. They were conscientious objectors. When they exhausted the opportunities of the tribunal system uh, and were turned down for any kind of exemption, they decided to take off, to disappear, draw the money out of the post office savings account and set off on their bikes. And they spent the whole of the summer of 1916 traveling around north of England on their bikes, supporting other CEOs who were on the run, staying at various places, Eventually, when the money ran out and the police still hadn't captured them, they decided, well, we don't think it's entirely a good idea to escape completely. We should go back and face the music. They felt that they had to make a political point and a public political point and did so. So they came back to Huddersfield, eventually ended up uh, in prison. Arthur Gardner had a nervous breakdown, eventually ended up on a uh, home office work scheme in East Anglia. Percy, on the other hand, stuck to his principles and remained an absolutist for the rest of the war. What's interesting about this, in a sense, illegality, is that it becomes part and parcel of a much wider illegality that's going on. It's not particularly well explored, but during the course of the First World War, there was a significant growth in the opportunities for expert forgers. Forgers who could forge army papers, and forgers in particular who could forge exemption papers. And here's one, most unlikely forger, Lottie Nish from Manchester. She'd forged papers before the war for suffragettes on the run. She continued to forge papers during the war for conscientious objectors on the run. You will find departments of the War Office are very concerned about the extent to which forges are operating, and if you want to escape military service, you pay the necessary amount, you get your papers forged, and you should be all right. Cases appear from time to time in local magistrates' courts, but the extent of that underground forging activity is not well known. And at the same time as we've got people racing around England from place to place with forged papers, we have, and in some extent, inherited from the pre-war women's movement, safe houses. Safe houses where suffragettes who have been released under the Cat and Mouse Act uh, found comfort and safety uh, ahead of the police re-arresting them and taking them back to prison. Many of those safe houses, and here's one in a suburb of Huddersfield called Quarmby, uh, many of these safe houses were pressed into service again during the course of the First World War by conscientious objectors. This one it's a pity that focus is not good. This is the house or the home of a, a family called Townend. The head of the family, Sam Townend, fascinating man, trade union activist. He'd been very active in a local textile mill uh, owned by a man called Sir Emmanuel Hoyle, who was better known as Man Oil. Sorry, it's the Yorkshire that's not quite getting through. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Sam was sacked. Couldn't find a job elsewhere in the textile industry. Uh, set up in business uh, with his own cart, his horse and cart, selling uh, mineral waters, pots and pans, uh, kitchen equipment, hardware, the lot. Did quite nicely, thank you very much. So much so that he was known throughout the Huddersfield and district as Pot Sam. And Pot Sam and all his family, and yes, his family and friends, were stalwart members of the left, independent Labour Party. The women in the family were all activists within the WSPU and of course, come the war, the sons were active in the anti-war movement and their home was used as a safe house for men on the run. You'll find other refuges for CEOs on the run, sometimes used in an extremely cheeky and confrontational manner. Here in Leeds, for example, we have members of the Leeds Brotherhood Church. Yeah, Tom and um, I've forgotten her surname. Lillian Ferris. Tom and Lillian Ferris, who were the key figures in the Leeds Brotherhood Church, which had its own workshop in Hunslet. And they had at any time about a dozen CEOs on the run. From time to time the police raided them, but usually the men had got away. Uh, and their one piece of what we might call real cheek uh, 
was that because they were having trouble placing one particular CEO on the run, they managed to insinuate him into Wakefield Work Centre, where CEOs were supposed to be. Well, he wasn't supposed to be there. When he went into Wakefield Work Centre, as a kind of refuge for being arrested by the police. He stayed there as long as he liked, he was fed, he had a place to stay, and when he had enough of Wakefield Work Centre, he disappeared somewhere else. And Tom and Lillian Ferris were part and parcel of that process. In addition to places like the Townend's home, the Ferris place in Hunslet in Leeds, we have splendid <coughs> rural locations like this. If you know anything about Robert Blatchford and the Clarion movement, the Clarion Ramblers, the cyclists and all the rest, throughout Northern England there were campsites, often with a house or a building in the middle of it, of it or toilets, accommodation, some kitchen facilities and so on, and you could camp out. And this particular Clarion campsite is in a most romantic place just below the shadow of Pendle Hill in Lancashire. I have a difficulty from time to time in thinking that anything good comes out of Lancashire in the auction but there you are. Here is the Clarion House just outside Nelson. And this was used, it was actually used by Arthur Gardner and Percy Ellis as a place to stay while they were on the run from the police in 1916. Some CEOs took this business of getting away from the authorities and from military service rather more seriously. They took it as an opportunity to begin the process of the revolution. The Socialist Labour Party, for example, which eventually became part and parcel of the Communist Party of Great Britain in the early 1920s, the SLP had what it called its flying squad. And one of the cohorts of that flying squad fetched up here, which is in the southern part of the Lake District, Broughton in Furness, it's a place called Green Moor. The, uh, the buildings there, the rather nice farm, farm buildings, uh, in the middle of nowhere, they were rented by a Socialist Labour Party member from Halifax called Dick Stokes, and he and his brothers ended up there as CEOs together with others, the hope being that they could take refuge in the countryside, emerge from time to time equipped with leaflets, their own eloquence as revolutionary preachers and stir the masses to oppose the war and perhaps begin the process of the revolution. Sadly, it didn't quite work that way, um, but nevertheless as a kind of memento of it, and again, the rock I'm standing on to take that picture, and you can just about to see me boot there, is also a CO commemorative rock there are initials carved into it, there's conscience objectors 1916 carved into it, and only about 18 months ago, Historic England decided to schedule it as an ancient monument. <laughs> I'm quite pleased about that. There's another dimension that we don't hear quite as much about in the anti-war movement as, as we might, in the history of the anti-war movement as we might, and that's the... and that's Ireland. Ireland, of course, didn't have a conscription for all sorts of very good reasons, as you can imagine, with the Easter Rising and all the rest of it. But it became somewhere that CEOs felt that they could escape. Arthur Horner here <coughs> rather did the different thing. He was minor in South Wales. He took the view that the only people fighting the British Empire in a way that he wanted were the Irish. And so he disappeared off to Ireland and got involved, according to his autobiography anyway, in parts of the Irish rebellion during 1916, came back to England when his wife had a child uh, and was arrested as a CO, taken to prison and so on. So the Irish dimension appears not just in Horner, but in the stories of lots of other CEOs. Here's one from Newport in South Wales, Arthur Riding, or Harry Riding rather. Harry Riding, Independent Labour Party man, arrested, sent to Dartmoor, he and about half a dozen of his friends, while on Dartmoor, decided they weren't going to stay there, and so they simply walked away. Ended up coming down here to Bristol, and eventually Harry made his way to Ireland, where he found a job on a farm, supported by local Irish nationalists, at least initially, 
until it became suspected that he was a British spy, in which case he had to leave Ireland rather quickly, ended up in Dublin, crossed to Liverpool, uh, and spent the rest of the war, interestingly enough, working as a textile labourer in the textile mills of Huddersfield. And then there are others who were part of that, what you might call that underground illegality that's part and parcel of the anti-war movement. Here, Archie Key as a young man, Archie Key as a much older man, Archie Key from, from Huddersfield, he and a group of other Huddersfield left-wingers decided that the war was nothing to do with them at all. They weren't going to hang around, wait to be conscripted, certainly not wait to be dragged into military service or prison or work centre or what have you. And they decided that they would go on the run and disappear from the country altogether. And here's where the Irish dimension comes into play yet again. They made their way, and it was pretty well known that if you made your way, certainly in the north of England, to Liverpool, then there was an opportunity, if your face fitted, and I'll come back to that in a moment, of getting completely away to North America. The Liverpool Secretary of the Coal Trimmers Union was an Irish nationalist. He was also a staunch left-wing socialist. He was quite happy to share the Irish nationalist underground escape route to North America with British or English socialist CEOs. Archie Key was one of them. Two other men from Huddersfield were part of the same group. They were provided with the necessary trade union papers. They were provided with work as coal trimmers on the SS Livonia here. And that's the kind of work they were doing deep in the bowels of the ship, shoveling and wheelbarrowing large amounts of coal from the bunkers <coughs> of the ships to the boilers at the rear part of the ship. Most of them were men who had not experienced that kind of high well, hand labor of that kind. Great difficulty, Archie Key's own memoir speaks of the fact that within a matter of hours, his hands were red raw, but he survived, got to New York, and in New York, by which time they were, being, they were being absorbed into the great mass of New York's population at the time. In New York, they were welcomed by something called the Four Winds Federation, and one of the key figures, not surprisingly, in the Four Winds Federation is Jim Larkin. He is his mugshot by the American police when he was taken up as an anarchist uh, and socialist rebel and revolutionary in the latter part of the war. So that Irish dimension, we don't know the extent of the numbers of men who went. We have at least 100, maybe 150, but the details, almost inevitably, because of the nature of the activity, are lost to us. With that in mind, some other things start to occur. And I have to thank my colleague Julian for pointing me in the direction of this wonderful source, the police Gazette. The Police Gazette, 1914 and before the war, of course, was the way in which the different police forces across the country communicated with each other, pursued men and women on the run for other reasons. And in the First World War, it becomes largely taken over, certainly in terms of sheer volume and sheer number of entries, by lists and lists and lists of men who have failed to return to barracks after leave, whatever. So much so that if you start to do the numbers, and here the pages, pages and pages of these things, I think we did a calculation, little Julian, that it was about 80,000 different men on the run at any one time in practically each year, certainly after 1960, right to the end of the war, which then prompts the question, if we are really <coughs> careful in our definition of war resistors, do we have to have war resistors who necessarily have the kind of motivation that I've mentioned so far and that Lois was mentioning earlier on? Can we have a much more informal definition of war resistor? How about a chap who goes on leave and doesn't come back? Is he a war resistor? Is he perhaps and this is my final 
question to you as much as anything else. Is he perhaps a representative of a British version <coughs> of the good soldier Schweik? Yaroslav Hasek's wonderful creation, creation of Central Europe, a Czech recruit in the Austro-Hungarian army who does everything possible to avoid getting anywhere near the front. He offers himself as a servant for an officer, as a batman, because he knows very well it's not likely to be dangerous. He from time to time feigns mental illness because he knows at least even when he gets found out he'll have spent a fair amount of time in a hospital and he'll be well fed and again away from the uh, fighting. He also makes a point of getting lost a lot. Yeah? He just loses his colleagues and appears from time to time ever so surprised with the military authorities. Oh, I'm telling you, sir, they went that way and I went that way and I just lost them. And he never actually gets really into trouble. I wonder if the British Army, by 1917, 1918, as conscription's really in full flow, whether the British Army ought to accept that there were plenty of Schweiks there, and perhaps we ought to accept that there's a Schweik definition of conscientious objection, just as much as a socialist or a religious one. Thank you. Fascinating stuff as usual. Any questions from Lois or Cyril? Please. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not familiar with this character. Oh, he should be. I should be clear. <laughs> it's in English translation. Okay, it's uh, Yaroslav Pike. Hasha. H A S E K. Okay, that's right. A right good read. Although I've edited most of the highlights are for you, so <laughs> but no, it's a very interesting piece of work. It's available uh, in Penguin. It's it is in Penguin. Still still is. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sure. Any other questions anyone wants to raise? No. Yeah. Just a couple of things. The um, <coughs> thing about the prisons and the situations in the press. Um, I'm quite intrigued with the fact that, I mean, in, in the sort of um, 80s, you had Bobby Sanders with the, the IRA and the Provos and that, with people calling himself a shit and yeah. not having their clothes. Uh, and then also Jimmy Boyle was famous as well for stripping off. Yeah. Um, it's quite interesting that you haven't found any real evidence of that sort of organised activity taking place. I mean, it may be that in the prisons... Not, not dirty processing the quite that way. Once yeah, there was. There was some. Yeah, yes. It's a, I don't think they ever got to the extent of covering themselves in ship, as you say. And, yeah. But uh, you will find um, cases, certainly in Wandsworth, of men who are banged up uh, in solitary, just setting about their cell yeah. and smashing everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a fact there's a whole suite of cells down in the basement of Wandsworth which hadn't been used for years, which we use the place where you put the most recalcitrant of CEOs. The new and, yeah, yeah, the real, real uh, hardcore, awkward squad. Yeah. Um, we don't hear as much about that perhaps as we might. Perhaps Julian will say something about it later on. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing was, I mean, I have read, you know, everybody reads about the First World War, as they've stayed in their life, like, you know. And it is the case that in some of them, I can't remember which one, but it is referenced that the the dock areas around around France, you know, Cali and places like that, were absolutely loaded with guys who were deserting. You know, that everywhere were there were all the woodlands and all the areas were, you know, um, uh, full of um, people who were in the hiding and they were very dangerous because most they were armed as well. Yeah. Uh, and they had to be looked after. And curiously enough, um, I read a, I'm reading a book just now, it's by a guy who was the medical officer with the um, second Royal, Royal Welsh Cruise of Leaders Dunn. And he wrote a little, he's got a little bit in in 1919 uh, where they come across two Australians who are still in hiding yeah. and, and very, very dangerous yes. uh, at yes. that time. So there, there was a lot of, um, it wasn't all Quakers, thank God, uh, who were resisting. There was a lot of guys armed. Uh, we were also not prepared to, to go back. Yeah.